Well, let's get started now with our election debate and with the videos that have caused a stir at home and internationally. We, bring, we begin with Mitt Romney's 47% comment. We've all heard about that by now. And when video leaked of Mitt Romney's comments at a conservative fundraiser, there was a very strong reaction. But President Obama did not come out unscathed for the week either. Video has released of him saying he believes in redistribution of wealth so that everyone has a fair shot. So let's ask our panelists. Um, many of the many have said that the video showing Romney writing off the 47 percent is a game changer. However, yesterday on 60 Minutes, Romney said he doesn't need to turn his campaign around. So I wanted to ask the panel, what do you think? And I'm going to start with you, Shirley, because you are the urban <laughs> game changer. So I, you know, is this a game change for him? Does he need to tr change his campaign around, or is he right on track? Is he is he speaking to his base? He's speaking to America because he's running for the United States of America's president. So absolutely he's on track. Um, I think the key thing when you think about candidates who are running in this country today, social media has a major effect. It changes the game quickly. The change is always going on through technology, through cell phones, through video cameras. They don't even know that's on. So all candidates on both sides have to be conscious of that. Romney's right on track on what he needs to stay on, which is the economy. And that's what really are people concerned about, the loss of jobs, uh, the lack of understanding that expansion of government is killing this country. It's killing California. So is he on track? Absolutely. Are any of us perfect? No, but we are definitely we definitely speak opinions and ideas that are out there that some agree or disagree with. Well, uh, let me stay with this side a little bit more. I mean, some people say that it shows his lack of understanding of, of taxpayers still, because many of them still do pay taxes. He was saying that, you know, these are people that, that aren't paying taxes. Right. Many of them are paying taxes in, in sales tax and payroll tax, and he's writing off, you know, almost 50%. What do you think about oh, that, Harris? Oh, that's not how I saw it at all. Okay. Yeah, um, I didn't even... When he's talking about 47%, he's talking about Obama supporters, and he's saying it's difficult for me I mean, this was a political analysis in front of a group of fundraisers where he's saying it's going to be difficult for me to get those voters to come over to my side. Making the argument that everyone understands a lot of this election is going to be decided in the middle. Um, on, on the half that pay no federal income taxes, it, it was only in 1970 that 12% of people paid no income taxes. Now it's half. Now, ironically, and I'm sure my friends on the left will bring this up, it was uh, Bush and Reagan tax cuts which removed so many low-income voters from the rolls entirely. But you do have a situation, as Romney said in his in the secret video, that you know my message of tax cuts is not going to be real persuasive to people that don't pay any federal income taxes. But now, I mean, a lot of those people in that forty-seven percent are seniors. You know, mm -hmm. people that he's going after, and you know they're on Social Security, so that's why they're not paying income tax. But yeah, he's winning it, the seniors. Is he writing yeah. them off by saying, "Well, I'm not go going after those people"? No, I, I think there's again, he, as he said, it was inelegant, and he's combining different numbers. Um, but clearly there, there is a huge rise in dependency, which is what he was getting at. People dependent on government, um, they have, they've given up, and uh, you know, whether it's food stamps, whether it's home, home heating, whether it's subsidy for your cell phone, whether it's your kids' school lunches, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, I mean, there are infinite uh, a number of needs and wants that people have. Unfortunately, we have a finite amount of money. And so we're in a situation where we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend from the Chinese and from our children. That's unsustainable, and that's what Romney's message is. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll go to the other side. We'll start with you, Paul. What did you think of, of Romney's statement about the 47%? Well, I think Romney shot himself in the foot. Um, if he's talking about 47% uh, of the people who he claims are moochers and living off the government, they're irresponsible, um, and it's true that that is uh, pretty close to the number that are Obama supporters today, but all of those people have friends and family and neighbors and coworkers who are in that small little middle strata that Romney and Obama are hoping to win over. And I don't think he did his campaign much good by calling 47% of the people moochers and, and uh, looking for government handouts. And, and Maddie, what do you say to, mm. to what Paul is saying? Well, I, I mean, when I saw the footage, um, I wasn't surprised, but I was pretty nauseated because I think you cannot even come close to running for a hallowed office such as a president and dismiss essentially half of your electorate. There's just no way. That, that shows someone who is completely on a different planet economically, um, emotionally, just cannot even relate to what half of the country is going through. Those people, um, a, a lot of them are elderly, yes. A lot of them are disabled. But majority are people that are 
making so little, they're at the poverty level. That's why they don't pay income taxes. Also because we have things like deductions and things that make it, that counter, counterbalance having to pay income taxes. But they pay for food. They pay sales tax, gas tax, payroll tax. So that, it, it's a bunch of bull, what he said. And I think it was insulting to half the country and to the people that are looking to our president to lead and say, I'm with you while you're struggling with three jobs and three kids. I think it shows his country club mentality. And to say that he was inelegant, inelegant is something that um, you, you ascribe to um, your, your golf swing or something when it's off one day. Inelegant, it was, it was callous, it was clumsy, and it was ignorant. Now, um, speaking of, of that same video, uh, you know, they're saying that two minutes of, of the video have been cut out, and uh, Romney, in, in during those two minutes, was talking about that the problem is with our debt is that the Fed keeps buying it out. Do you think that those two minutes were purposefully left out? Was that Romney trying to reach out to the Ron Paul supporters, and, and is he going to have any su success with that? I was going to ask you, Shirley. Um, I just want to go back to a little bit of what she was saying uh, um, as far as uh, the economy and the people that don't pay. I want to make it clear that there are thousands of illegal immigrants in this country, and we pay a lot for these people. You talk about state taxes and local taxes. Well, I pay the same thing, but I also pay income taxes. Mm -hmm. And I'm also registered, and mm -hmm. I have a legal Social Security card. And I understand people may not like the fact that he said 47 percent, but there are a lot of people living in the country right now off the government. We're paying for all these people. And I get appalled that we continue to pay these people and they want some kind of out. They have their excuse. They have their sap stories and their sod story. We all have stories. But you know what? As Republicans, we believe that we have to be fiscal responsible, not in the expansion of government or government programs. And as we continue to grow in this city, and especially in the state of California, it is clear that we can see we are expanding inner city programs programs that continue to pay for everybody and you cannot pay for everybody and if you do how is that money going to come when you continue to not even build big businesses or even small businesses in the state so when we talk about Romney and the video and he's talking about the people that don't pay taxes those taxes that are not coming as revenue are not paying for these programs but it's not. But are those 47 percent, are, are there voters And you, know, you continue that? to say seniors. This is not about just seniors. This is about people as abroad, from illegal immigrants to legal immigrants to Americans who are not even registered to vote, to Americans who don't even want to be on the charts. I think we but have he's a, also multiple about issues here, multiple issues, and you're really getting far off track. So I think we should pull it back. And if we're going to address the broader I economy, I think we should. I well, yeah, I mean, yes, I, but then, but then you're talking yeah. about my rebuttal to your kind of offshoot of a question. I think we should stay on to, on focus. Well, I'm glad you think that way. I disagree with you. I still stand on the point that as a, <laughs> a responsible person in America, we continue to pay for everyone, and we cannot continue that's, to pay for not the program. But do you think? I mean, he was talking percentage. about 47. Those are 47 percent that are going to vote for Obama. You you brought up illegal immigrants. Are those are those voters? It remains to be seen. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, yes, we were just, there have been a number of states that have been true, introduced uh, voting rights acts and uh, voter identification acts. Um, but, you know, when those are brought up, you see studies show that there isn't a lot of voter fraud. I understand that, but you also have a president that's going to waive them having them to have rights to be in this country, yeah. free and clear. So it, clearly that's he ridiculous. looks at those where numbers. You, where, it is very clear that Obama pull that knows out that those numbers are factors in this race okay. and that if he was able to make them all legal, those people could yeah, vote I, in I, his I, best interest. I think there's one issue, which is uh, there's no side that has a monopoly on compassion. So it's not as though Romney's uncom uncompassionate and, and Obama is so compassionate. Um, something like a quarter of the disability claims are fraudulent. Uh, 60 Minutes says there's Absolutely. 60 billion dollars in waste, fraud, and abuse in the Medicare program. Um, food stamps has doubled. There's videos on YouTube about how to scam the food stamp program. I mean, this is not an issue about compassion. These programs are out of control. I mean, in Obama's first year in office, he raised spending 18 percent. You know, the Democrats love to say, you know, Clinton was the guy who balanced the budget. Only Democratic president can balance the budget. We spent 1.8 trillion under Clinton and brought in 2 trillion in revenues. Now, Obama's spending 3.8 trillion. We're spending 2 trillion dollars more every single year just since Clinton, just since 2000. And even though revenues are up 500 billion dollars, it can't keep up with the out of control spending. Mm -hmm. So, someone's got to give and um, you know, I, I'm not sure what Obama wants to cut. He's proposed a budget that couldn't get a single vote in either House of Congress. Okay. 
So it's not very serious. Okay, well, we, we've moved a little bit from, you know, people who are paying taxes to a number of issues of immigration, mm -hmm. voter fraud, um, national debt, those kinds of things. But I'm going to have Paul, you know, is, is there a topic in that that you want to specifically address? Well, yeah, let me address some of the comments that uh, both Shirley and Harris made. Um, first of all, when you look at uh, the number of uh, undocumented workers, uh, most of them are working in this country. Uh, and most of them are paying taxes. So to talk about uh, somehow the rest of us are carrying the load and somehow they're living off of us, that's ridiculous. I mean, they're paying taxes. They're, most of them are making minimum wage. They're living um, two, three, four, five, and six to small apartments that most of us would not want to live in. Uh, and they're doing jobs really, quite frankly, that most um, Americans don't want to do. So I think that that's, uh, it's, a, it's a scapegoating. It's scapegoating a particular sector of the population that uh, is not the cause of the, of the economic problems. Now, if we want to talk about taxes and the economic problems, um, here's a couple of facts to look at. After the Second World War, over 40% of all of the revenue that came into the federal government came from corporations. Today, it's less than 10%. There's no way the rest of us can make up the difference. So now there's shortfalls in state and local and federal budgets, and we see massive cutbacks going on in health care, education, other needed social services. And so now people who, who had jobs and who were paying taxes before now are unemployed. And yeah, what are they going to do? They're going to go to government programs to help bail them out. And my guess is that if Shirley and Harris lost their jobs and didn't have a support network to keep them from going hungry, I'll bet they would go down and apply for whatever government aid was available. Right, but how many weeks is enough? Is it 20 weeks, 100 well, weeks, five years of unemployment? I mean, at what point does unemployment become welfare? How, how, how long is it going to take for us to get our country back on track where we start creating jobs so these people can get back to but work? you guys don't believe in job creation. You <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, it's no, 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 that's not true. No, no, no. And I've worked for myself, just for you know. I've always worked for myself. Yeah. My parents worked for myself, so themselves. So as far as working for somebody else, the way I was raised, you get out there and you make it happen. You develop it. You get out there and you build those small businesses and you, sm you support local government. Okay. That's what we believe. So I, I don't agree with you on that. Okay. Well, we're going to go on a little bit more, um, keep talking about this uh, conversation um, about wealth distribution. And, you know, there was a, a video from then Illinois Senator Barack Obama talking in 1998 where he says he believe it, believes in re redistribution of wealth. And he says, at a certain level, to make sure everyone's got a shot. But, uh, you know, that video went out, it went virally to a lot of Republicans, and it was a kind of a gotcha uh, to brand him as a socialist. But what was edited out of that clip as well was that um, what he went on to say was, how can we pool resources at the same time as we decentralize delivery systems in ways that both foster competition, can work in the marketplace, and can foster innovation at the local level, and can be tailored to particular communities? So Harris, I just wanted, do you think that clip makes a difference for him saying the rest of it, or, or did you stop at wealth distribution? Well, there was more. There was more from that video that was also uh, shown out, where he basically said, "I want to, you know, form an army of the uh, of those people on welfare, and we can get a voting power block from that." So it, it actually, it's funny. It's the flip side of Romney's comments, um, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's news that that he believes in redistribution. I mean, he told Joe the plumber, "We got to spread the wealth around." Um, he's obviously never worked in the private sector. He's never met a payroll. He's never run so much as a lemonade stand. So he doesn't understand business. As far as I know, he's never had any economics courses. And here he is trying to turn around you know, the largest economy in the world. And it's not going to happen as long as he has a war on capitalism and a war on job creators. Now, he so, has created jobs. It just hasn't been to the level Not on that, he hasn't. There's still 12 million people unemployed. Absolutely. He ha but he, obviously, we, he's 30 pulling months out of, the of hole, job, so. steady well, job Talk creation. a little bit about that. I mean, he, there have been jobs created, but definitely not enough, and he admits to that. Yeah. Well, I don't think you take a situation that he came into, and I'm not going to play that same old card of he inherited a disastrous economy, but, economy, but everyone knows that that's you true. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't come into something that has been the worst uh, near depression or great recession since the depression, you know. So I don't think that you can just turn a, a barge of that, that size around overnight. The truth is, is that when he first came into office, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. And when his, within that, that first period that he was in, he started to turn around, and we've had 30 months 
of steady job creation, and everyone knows that's true. The stimulus worked. Everyone knows that that's true uh, as well. I disagree with no, that. No, we totally disagree with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it's well, not working, especially not in California with 12% well, unemployment you right now. Yeah. So. Okay. So, I, okay. um, but, you know, I mean, speaking of, you know, Romney was on 60 Minutes uh, last night talking about, you know, he, he believes in a, a, the progressive tax system with people p paying different rates. He even talked about, you know, uh, Social Security, Medicare, that he wanted to let people know that, you know, the low-income um, folks were going to get more benefits and high-income folks were going to get less benefits. Isn't that a, a sort of a redistribution of wealth? The progressive income tax rate structure? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it is. Um, the, the, the problem with, with some of these numbers, and Obama says this too, you know, I've created jobs month after month. Um, if the workforce was the same size as when Bush was here, unemployment would be 11%. We now have 40, 43 months of, of over 8% unemployment. Right. This is the weakest recovery, weakest recovery since uh, the Great Depression. And I don't think that's all something he inherited. That is a function of job creators sitting on their hands because they don't know what their regulations are going to be. They don't know what their taxes are going to be. They don't know uh, what they're going to have to do for health care reform. How many, you know, if they get more than 50 employees, then all these other burdensome, onerous regulations come on. And, and corporations are sitting on trillions of dollars in cash. And they're not going to invest as long as they've got nope. Obama in the White House have, at war with business. And as long as they have stimulus packets that will subsidize for what they want, they're going to act like they have no money. And you watch, if Obama's reelected, you're going to find out they're going to all of a sudden cry broke. And he's going to have to create another stimulus packet that will come from the American people. Who's going to pay for all these programs? In California, we have over 12% unemployed right now, and they're still hurting in this state. We have too many programs, and if we continue with these programs to help the poor or the needy or whatever, you guys make it seem like we're unsympathy, uh, we're unsympathy for those people. We have sympathy, we're sympathy for these people, but what we don't have is uh, the ability to pay for them all. And you know, that's why we talk about taxes and types of, of distribution of taxes. But... How else are you going to pay for them? Somewhere it's going to look, get, where's the money going to come from? That's what I think my question right. is to you. Look, here's really what's at the essence of, I think, the problem that we're facing. There has been a massive distribution of wealth in this country from the pockets of millions and millions and millions of people that make up the 99%, if you want to use a popular phrase, uh, and into the pockets of the very, very wealthy. If you look at, when I was a young man growing up in Buffalo, New York, which is where I'm from, um, the head of Bethlehem Steel made about $230,000 a year, and the average steel worker was making maybe $8 or $9 an hour, something like that. Today, you have the heads of giant corporations making hundreds of millions of dollars, or tens, or, or some even hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then with all of the, the tax loopholes that they've been able to get through Congress, um, you've got a case where you've got giant corporations that are making huge profits, are paying no taxes, and in fact even getting rebates from the taxes that the rest of us pay. One example is the year after the financial meltdown, 2009, um, ExxonMobil uh, made big profits that year. Um, Rex Tillerson, the CEO, uh, took home something like $27 million that year in pay, and ExxonMobil got a tax rebate of $156 million from the taxes that we pay. You combine that with offshore secret accounts where these people are hiding their money, there's tons of money in the society. This is a very productive system. The thing is it's being siphoned off by those at the very top, okay. and that's at the crux of the economic crisis that. that we've got. I'll let you address it, and then I wanted to end it. Uh, we are going to yeah. be closing out soon. Yeah, you know, I, I cover corporations for a living, and I can tell you the corporations are following the tax laws. They're on the books. So they're not doing anything shifty. Um, frequently what happens is companies are making money in foreign countries where the profits stay in those foreign countries. Um, as far as our economic yeah, problems what, what are not a result that, of CEOs making a lot of money. I mean, even Obama wants to tax the millionaires and billionaires. That's Absolutely. his big pitch. You'll raise about $80 billion a year. We have a $1.3 trillion deficit. It may feel good for the envy right. for people on the left that are jealous that the CEO is making a lot of money. Right. That doesn't create jobs. Envy does not create jobs. It has nothing no, to do no, with envy. Penalizing. It's, it's, no, it's, a, it's inequity. It's an, it's, this is all about inequity, and everyone knows that. It's the essence of what this country was founded on and where it's going. And that's why we were talking earlier about the choice is clearer, because do you want a country where everybody is in it on their own, 
you know, everybody for themselves, this fear-based rationale that somebody's taking something from me, which is, this emanates from some of your arguments. It's all about what these others are taking from me, these scapegoated other, this mysterious other. This country was founded on, on others. We're all others in this, and we're all in it together. And I come from a faith perspective, and I think that you cannot have the inequity that we have in this country and say, oh, well, it's our tax laws. Well, no, I mean, there's the spirit of the law, and there's individuals that go out of their way to manipulate the law. There's companies like Bain Capital who, who so, don't pay so you any believe corporate in penalizing taxes. They go out of their way. No, no, this has nothing to do with pen penalizing uh, somebody for their, their success or envying their success. It's called participating. I am my brother's keeper. I, I, I need but what they I do need and we they share. They pay their portion that is okay. No, they don't. Well, and let me Paul finish, finish that point. I disagree with you. You talked well, a little bit about that there is a clear choice. So obviously for you, there is a clear choice. It's a moral choice. Okay. Um, and what about you, Harris? Is there yeah, a clear it, choice it, it's here? It's a clear choice. We can go down the path towards our founding, and I would reject the way she's characterized our founding. We were founded on individual liberty and freedom That's correct. and free markets and property rights. We weren't founded on some collective socialist it, idea. The other path is towards a uh, European-style welfare state. And, and, you know, we're cradle to grave. Julia takes, you know, every interaction in her, her day is with government, taking care of her. And we know how that ends up. We can see Greece. We can see Portugal. We can see Spain. It ends up with riots on the street when people suddenly realize that there's no money. Okay. You eventually you run out of other people's money. Well, I, I think there will be a clear choice mm -hmm. if, let's say, Romney uh, wins the White House and, and you know, uh, they take over Congress, Republicans takes over Congress, or, um, it, or vice versa, you know, Obama wins and the Congress is taken over by Democrats. What if there there's a, a balance? What what if there's I, I think the clear I, th I think the clear thing we all have to agree on. We know that we have an economy issue. We also know that there we have lack of jobs. We also know that we have problems in the Middle East as well as at home. And if we do not take care of home, if we cannot make both sides work in the best interest of the people, then we fail. We've got to work on both sides of the aisle to get it across. But with Romney, Romney is focusing on the economy. He is focusing on jobs. We're not talking about like the DNC that continue to talk about expansion of government, that continue to talk about taking God out of certain liberties that are out there. Um, you know, taking I'm a believer. I, I didn't cut you off. You continue to think that you're the only Christian on this panel, and there are those of us here do are believers as well and we believe in a different factor that you do well I'm not expanding government I'm talking about people being responsible for people and not attacking someone just because they're wealthy you want to get more out of them and you want to complain against them and go after them because they were smart enough to think a little bit better out of the box than most people okay I realize there's corruption in corporations that are understanding the way they think capitalism is but we believe in small government and small businesses and that's going to change this country yeah there's also there's a commingling of if you care and you believe in, in the community that has to be done through government. We've had private charities function very effectively in this country for 250 years. Not everything has to be done through the government. There's, there's plenty of, there is a role for the private sector. And, and especially with social, well, social media. Yeah. Social media with Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, they can find any of us on there if you're very mm -hmm. active in that. A lot of people operating businesses out of their home. Okay. And we've never had that before. Wealth that allows you to interact with people from other countries as well. And, and, and Paul, what do you think the balance is between you know, the, the government taking care of its people and, and also encouraging private growth? Well, I, obviously it has to do both. But I think if we look at you know, what the, the history has been over the last 40 years, um, it really, again, has been this um, shift of more and more power and control in the hands of a, very, of a smaller and smaller group of very wealthy and powerful people. So my friends on the uh, Republican side talk about we want a country of freedom and small business. There, we're not going back to 1776 or 1820. Those days are long gone. The real powers in this society are giant multinational, primarily U.S. based, but not just U.S. based, but giant multinational corporations and banks that dictate politics not only in this country but to countries all over the world, including to Europe. Okay. Well, well, let's uh, talk about some of the social programs out there. We're, you know, we were talking about Medicare and Social Security. Um, much of this election has been about social programs and who's throwing ma grandma off the cliff, uh, so to speak. So, you know, Romney has said his first order of business, if he gets elected, is to repeal Obamacare, which was obviously, you know, also inspired by Romney Care. 
How tough of a message, uh, Harris, do you think that's going to be to bring home? You know, if it worked in Massachusetts, why not for the rest of the country? Well, if it's if it's tested in one place, why not expand well, it? If, if you can, for starters, there's federalism. The whole idea was the Constitution is a limited document, limits the central government, and everything else is reserved to the state. So if Massachusetts wants to experiment with a health care program, you know, more power to them, they're welcome to do that. I, I don't think he'll have any problem uh, repealing Obamacare if he wins because it still remains unpopular. Um, it, it siphons off, you know, $716 billion from Medicare and seniors will find out one day that they can't get a doctor because a fifth of the hospitals are broke and doctors aren't taking any more Medicare patients. And that was the same uh, amount, the $760 million that was right, in, the, uh, in the... In the Ryan budget, Ryan. right, the path to prosperity, yeah. That is a totally different approach. That approach uses market forces much like Medicare Advantage, which seniors are already using, you know, gives them the choice of staying in traditional Medicare or getting a you know, voucher, if you will, to go out and shop just like they do shop for everything else. Okay. Um, what about you, Paul? How, how, you know, why, if it worked in Massachusetts, why not the rest of the country? Well, I agree. Um, and really, I believe we really need to go further than that. I applaud Obama for what he's done. He's, he's broadened health care to millions of Americans who didn't have it before. But we really need to go further than that. What we really need to do is we need to create a Medicare for all system. And if we did that, put everybody all in the same risk pool, and we would be able to save about $400 million just in um, administrative costs and profits that now go to private insurance companies. 23 to 25 cents of every healthcare dollar today goes to private insurance companies, big CEO salaries, advertising, and all the rest of it. And we can run a Medicare for all system on three or four cents of every healthcare dollar. Let's put that other 20 cents back into the healthcare system and deliver quality healthcare for all the people. All right, well, we're gonna have add? to leave oh, it for, uh, there oh. for right now because this is the end of our part one of the special election edition of Crown City News. We'll be back with another half hour to discuss the economy and um, jobs and world events and um, break with our panel of guests and comments and questions. Well, you can feel free to call into our um, our studio, uh, the number is listed at the bottom and also on our Facebook and Twitter sites. We have uh, Maddie Briggs, uh, Paul Crabiel, Shirley Hussar, and Harris Hall for their uh, expert in opinions here. And we thanks, all, thanks to all of our sponsors, including Southern California Edison, Wink Marketing, the Pasadena Enterprise Center with available office space, and Dr. Fareed Zarif. Uh, Thanks to the CCN crew, the show would not be possible without you. We thank you for watching CCN Crown City News. Join us each week as we cover the news in Pasadena and the San Gabriel Valley. For all of us here at CCN, I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. Have a great week. Over the last 20 years, I've given thousands of adjustments to all kinds of people, from celebrities such as Johnny Cash and Jane Seymour, to friends, family, neighbors, and the local community. No matter what's going on with you, whatever kind of symptoms, whether it's headaches, neck pain, back pain, high blood pressure, whatever it is, the healing comes from inside you. So if you make the nervous system stronger through getting adjusted, then your life will get better, you will get better. So if you want to learn more about what we're doing here and how chiropractic may help you, please visit my website, nolimitchiro.com. Hi, Dr. Zari with Kids for Better Health. Today we're talking about a very important issue, weight loss. If you're obese, you're overweight, there is uh, something that you can do. I'm going to give it to you very simply. People, places, and things. Number one, make sure you are around people that can sympathize you with your own. People that want to see you succeed. You don't want to be around somebody that is competing against you and making you feel any less than great. Number two, 
places. This means select places to go where you are at that happiness, where people are there that love you, where you can feel relaxed. If it's a recreational environment, whether you're exercising, out in the park, walking with uh, your dogs, playing with the children, this tour you surround yourself with a wonderful, loving environment. And lastly, number three, see. Make sure that you select the things that make you better, such as your nutrition, what you drink. Make sure that what goes in your body can help your body become a healthier body. Dr. Ruffin, good tips 